Welcome to this week's Archaeological News. I've got some great stories for you. First, I'm looking at astronomical alignments used by ancient farmers in the basin of Mexico. Then I'm discussing the oldest narrative scene carved into a bench at the pre-pottery Neolithic site of Seyburk in Turkey. I also look into a rediscovered fresco in Peru by the Moshe culture and the Copper Age owl plaques in southwestern Iberia. Stay with me for my comments at the end. In ancient Mexico, people used topography to create an accurate calendar. A recent paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences details new research into how the inhabitants of the Basin of Mexico kept an accurate agricultural calendar. For a long time, experts have known that the pre-conquest inhabitants of the region were able to support their large population, which is estimated to have been somewhere between 1 and 3 million, with an efficient farming system. However, for this to have been effective, an agricultural calendar must have been developed in line with the solar year, and it's not been clear how this was achieved. The basin of Mexico has an arid spring followed by heavy rain in the summer, which means the planting of crops in ancient times had to be planned accurately to avoid a disastrous crop. 16th century chroniclers talk of how sowing, harvesting, tilling and cultivating were strictly scheduled activities approved by elders. These chroniclers also mentioned how the farmers had a system for monitoring the leap year, but researchers have struggled to find evidence for how they did this. What is clear is that the Mexica calendar was in sync with seasonal change throughout the solar year. Much work has been done on the solar alignments of temples and urban centers in Mesoamerica. These would have served as sufficient markers for annual ceremonies and rituals. However, the accuracy required for a farming calendar would have needed additional mechanisms for measurement. The researchers found that topographic features, as viewed from the top of Templo Mayor, would have helped the Mexica to accurately track the solar year. Sunrise during the winter solstice would have broken behind Mount Tehuicacone. The sun would have risen behind the settlement of Tepetlaustoc in the foothills of the Sierra de Patlachic on the summer solstice. On the 16th of March and the 30th of September, the sun would have risen behind the meek of Mount Taloc, and on the 1st of March and the 15th of October, it would have risen behind the peak of Mount Telepon. So Mount Taloc would have been used as the reference point by which the rest of the solar year was calculated. Chronicles appear to corroborate this. Sahagun mentioned that on the festival known as Atulcahualo, which fell five days before the equinox, the Mexica celebrated a feast to the Taloc gods of rain. This coincides with the dry foresummer before the monsoon-type rains came. At the beginning of the month of Takul Huitontli, which followed the summer solstice, celebrations were made to the goddess of salt. The basin of Mexico's salt works were in Lake Texaco, close to the Sierra de Patlachic, where sunrise on the summer solstice would have been viewed. Other celebrations also appeared to coincide with the topographical markers for the solar year. Another curious but man-made feature that may have played a role in tracking the solar year is the causeway on the western slope of the peak of Mount Taloc. The 150 meter long and 6 meter wide causeway leads from a 40 by 50 meter rectangular enclosure that once had walls of between 2 and 3 meters in height. The causeway is on a slightly different axis to the enclosure and it's thought this may have been intentional in order to align it with the setting sun. Researchers discovered that an observer on the lower end of the causeway would see the sun rise in the centre of the upper part of the ramp on the 23rd or the 24th of February, which marked the beginning of the new year. Other site markers, such as a monolith on the lower end and a now missing monolith which stood on its upper side, would have helped make the astronomical observations more precise and account for leap year adjustments. Ceramic fragments have been excavated from and close to the enclosure by archaeologists over the years, which suggests that ceremonies also took place there. 
It's likely that the causeway predates the Templo Mayor and acted as the main structure for such astronomical calculations before it was built. Overall, there's a very persuasive argument outlined in this paper for how the agricultural calendar was calculated in the basin of Mexico during pre-conquest times. The paper discussing this research is open access. I've put the details in the description below if you want to read more on it. Earliest known narrative scene depicted in Turkey. In 2021, archaeologists working at the site called Seyburk in southeastern Turkey discovered a wall relief dating to the 9th millennium BCE, which is the oldest narrative scene found in the world so far. A recent paper published in the journal Antiquity details this enigmatic sculpture. Seyburg is a pre-pottery site located 60 kilometers east of the Euphrates River. A modern village was built over the top of it in 1949, and there's also a Roman settlement right next to it. In the north of the site, archaeologists have partially excavated communal buildings, one of which contains the narrative relief. Residential buildings were discovered in the south of the village, about 70 metres from the communal structures. The relief is on the side of a stone bench inside a communal building, which measures 11 metres in diameter. Cavities along the wall suggest that pillars may once have partitioned the space. There are five figures depicted on the inner face of the bench, making up a 3.7 metre long panel. One male human figure is carved in high relief, holds a phallus in its right hand and faces into the room. He wears a V-shaped necklace or neckband. This principal figure is faced on both sides by leopards carved in low relief. By the way, this whole scene looks pretty hazardous to me, but I'll get into that in the comments. On the left of the Western leopard, another male human is depicted, but in low relief and sideways, also with a phallus. His back is turned to the principal male human and the leopards. His left hand has six fingers and in his right hand there appears to be a snake or a rattle. He is faced by a bull carved sideways in low relief with deliberately exaggerated horns. The researchers conclude that the style of the relief is typical of themes depicted in Neolithic art. However, where it differs is that there appears to be two narrative scenes which are related to one another. The V-shaped necklace or neckband is similar to depictions at Gobekli Tepe and the Yeni Mahala sculpture. Oral traditions were probably important to the pre-pottery Neolithic inhabitants of the site, and it's likely that this relief depicted stories that held significance to the community. Archaeologists rediscover a lost fresco in Peru. In 1916, a German ethnologist, Hans Heinrich Brüning, discovered a mural which formed part of the Huaca Pintada temple in Peru. He took black and white photographs of it, but no experts have tried to find the site since. Now, archaeologists have rediscovered the fresco, which appears to show mythological scenes and is in excellent condition. The team, led by Swiss archaeologist Sam Gavani, spent four years searching for the mural, which dates back around 1,000 years, and was found to be covered in thick foliage. It's around 30 metres in length and uses blue, brown, red, white and yellow paints to depict warriors and a bird-like deity. Ongoing research will try to decipher the fresco. The Huaca Pintada temple belonged to the Moshe culture, who inhabited the region between the 1st and 8th centuries CE and venerated the moon, rain, iguanas and spiders. Rather unusually, the fresco mixes styles from both the Moshe and the Lambayek cultures. Copper Age owl plaques may have been created by children. During the Copper Age between 3500 and 2750 BCE, the inhabitants of southwestern Iberia produced thousands of palm-sized slate plaques engraved with owls. Most experts think they may have been ritual objects and that the owls were meant to depict anthropomorphic goddesses. However, a recent paper in Nature suggests that they may have been created by or with the involvement of children for the purpose of play as well as for eventual use in rituals. 
Around 4,000 of these plaques have been found so far, many on the top of megalithic graves. They are carved with geometric patterns which appear to depict the bodies of owls and have two eyes etched in the top of them. Most of them also have one or two perforations in the top which may have held a string or feathers, the latter to further elaborate their resemblance to owls. The researchers believe two species of owl are depicted, both of which are present in southwestern Iberia. The little owl known as Athena noctua and the long-eared owl known as Asio Otis. In the past, experts have suggested a connection to the pre-dynastic slate palettes of ancient Egypt. Others have thought they represent female deities common in the prehistoric Mediterranean, and at least one scholar put forward the idea that they depict the dead person in the megalithic grave themselves. The latest research suggests that the slates depict owls as conceived by a child. Furthermore, the mass availability of the slate material, as well as the speed and simplicity with which such designs could be created, both suggest that a child could have crafted them as recreational objects. This does not exclude their use in a ritual setting, so the fact they have been found on megalithic graves probably means they were also used in ceremonies. Other evidence has been put forward in the past for the mixed recreational and ritual use of objects during the Chalcolithic. That's it, I have a couple of comments as usual. The astronomical alignments in the basin of Mexico are pretty convincing. Experts know for sure that agricultural planning had to have been absolutely perfect to sustain such a large population. And the timing and naming of the festivals certainly seem to offer anecdotal support for the more scientific calculations. The narrative scene in Seyberg fascinates me. I wonder what story they were trying to tell. That guy with the phallus surrounded by leopards with sharp teeth seems brave, if not a little foolish. If that's supposed to point towards a fertility cult, as is often suggested when phallic symbolism appears in the ancient world, then shouldn't he be protecting his reproductive tool a little bit better than that? I think it's amazing that the fresco in Peru was found in such good condition after all this time. I'm looking forward to the interpretation of it. I don't have my own interpretation because I don't know enough about Mesoamerican mythology at the moment. Could the owl plaques have been created by children? As I've said many times before, the ancients don't appear to have kept a strict separation between practical day-to-day matters and that of a ritual nature. Everything was connected. These plaques may well have been toys which were ritually deposited when the child came of age, for example, as some sort of a rite of passage, maybe as gifts to the ancestors, which is why they are found on megalithic graves. That's just my take on it. But I do agree with the paper that there's every chance they were both toys as well as ritual objects. Anyway, thank you for watching everyone please hit the like button and a big thank you to those who support me via channel membership, super chats and Patreon. It's a great help and keep those comments coming. There's a lot of knowledge in this community and I think we've got some great conversations happening between us. Don't forget to share with your friends if they're into history or if you think they should be and I'll see you next time.